Good evening. Thank you very much for tuning in to our seventh debate of term. Questions of racial inequalities were brought firmly back into the public consciousness last year. And as the old, oldest debating um, society in the world, um, it is right that we at the Union are discussing this topic tonight. A collaborative enterprise with Cambridge's African and Caribbean Society, this debate will add, look to add nuance and sensitivity to a conversation that is all too often reduced to a binary discussion. It will recognize the troubling reality of racism in the 21st century, but it will also seek to probe more deeply um, into the diverse opinions that exist over how is best to combat it. Do we have a duty to be activists? Is it deplorable to remain unvocal? Or do these expectations hinder the cause? These are the questions we will be discussing with our motion tonight, this house believes silence is complicity. On this call, to discuss the issue, we have four eminent guest speakers and two student speakers from the African and Caribbean Society. There's been much engagement with this event on social media, so I hope plenty of you will get involved in the audience by sending in questions or points of information in response to the speeches you hear tonight. You can do this by following the link in the description below, as always. Uh, now, without further ado, I will introduce our first speaker for the proposition. Um, our first speaker is Joshua Vassarami. Joshua is an artist, writer and political activist, and he has played a central role in both the Occupy movement and Black Lives Matter protests. His most recent book, How it, to Change It, was published by Penguin last year and offers a guide for political activism in the 21st century. Joshua, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Freddie. And it's Joshua Vir Virasami for, for anybody for future reference. Um, it's absolutely fine. Uh, thank you for inviting me to participate in this debate. Um, I've never been in a debate before, so this is quite exciting for me and quite fun and new. Um, and I hope that we, we interrogate the subject and we all get to learn something from this and make, make some advancements on the conversation. So I want to begin by stating that my contribution today isn't intended to be a kind of moralistic tirade because for me silence is a spectrum and the truth is that I myself am silent on some issues and that might be because I don't feel I have the right words or because I still don't feel I'm le uh, or feel like I'm learning enough, enough of an issue but what I have learned uh, on my journey for activism is that right words whether on social media or elsewhere are offered too high a regard and right action is just as if not more important than right words. And right action to me is best understood as solidarity, a helping hand, not charity, but empathy. And an intuition that our freedoms are bound up to one another. To me, that is a lot of what constitutes solidarity. If silence is complicity, then solidarity is to be outspoken, to be actively dismantling. And this is a theme that I hope to return to um, as, I, as I continue. So, the reason I think we should invoke the indictment that silence is complicity is not to summon guilt. Um, it's not to kind of invoke the punitive impulses which carceral capitalism, something we've all had to contend with, with the, since the summer imbues us with. We should summon it in my mind because the power of one person being outspoken, one person showing up in solidarity, one person choosing solidarity is enough to bring tens of millions to the streets, to shift popular culture, to end regimes. One such example of that is Darnell Fraser. On May 25th, 2020, 17-year-old Darnell Fraser, a black woman from Minnesota, witnessed an extrajudicial routine police killing of an unarmed black civilian. She did not stop until the world was made aware. She, she was hell-bent on making the world aware. She risked death or imprisonment because that's what happens to people. The, the guy who filmed Eric Garner did actually get imprisoned and we, we all know it's an act of vengeance. She persisted with this story. And when local media regurgitated a police cover-up of the killing, she persisted, she posted, she shared. She would not be silenced. Eventually, the world would know the name of the man who was killed, George Floyd. We should choose, uh, we choose silence for any number of reasons. Sometimes we are, you know, ideologically, diametrically opposed to justice and we, we do it from that standpoint. And sometimes we are simply afraid. Sometimes we are unsure. But the invocation, for, the provocation for this debate makes me feel like in these times, to be afraid or to be unsure is actually to grease the machines of death. 
and we miss an opportunity to do as many have done before us and and take a stand to do as the french workers want somebody just told me a story really recently that i really like about french workers who, who went into the factory when there was a labor dispute and when they were upset about their wages not getting met they threw their clogs into the machinery and the french word for clogs is savos and that is the origin of the of the phrase sabotage and also of clogging up the machine, which is a great little anecdote. And I like to put it in every, every talk I give now. Um, but I want to begin this, my contribution, where perhaps where this kind of, where the end point of where we go if we continue this provocation. And by summoning the words of a person who remarked on the nature of silence very often, particularly when it bellowed in the face of great injustice. And that man is, of course, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, open quote. In the end... We will, not, we, are, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. To King, silence was a betrayal of all that is just and good. Silence was complicity. Of course, we can all recognize times in life when someone's silence accounts to a complicity of sorts. It's quite a, a basic uh, idea. I've, I've been on a train and faced racist abuse and felt heavily the silence of the crowd. I've been attacked by police officers on a, on a platform at a train station and watched passengers walk by with, with pity, even apologize for their silence, actually. Um, there's nothing remarkable about this statement as it stands, silence is complicity. But it is worth spelling out at this opportunity what complicit silence in the context of racial capitalism means. What it means to grease the machines of, of death and misery. Howard Zinn, uh, another giant of the civil rights era, is a white ex-soldier, come historian and kind of a revolutionary protagonist who struggled alongside the likes of Alec Baker, who was, of course, a mentor to Martin Luther King, is famous for often repeating a phrase which will go on to become the title of his memoir. And the phrase is, you can't be neutral on a moving train. Zinn would explain it as such, open quote, I can't remember if I closed the last quote now, open quote, you can't be neutral on a moving train, I would tell them. Some were baffled by the metaphor, especially if they took it literally and tried to dissect its meaning. Others immediately saw what I meant. What I meant. That events are already moving in certain deadly directions and to be neutral means to accept that. At the height of the global unrest surrounding the uh, extrajudicial killing of George Floyd last summer, I wrote an article which was shared widely and, and later republished in a book and it opens to be, not, to be neutral to be passive in a situation, the historian Howard Zinn tells us, is to collaborate with whatever is going on. And we can replace the word silence with Zinn's neutrality. Um, and neutrality can be expressed in, in many forms, of course, but perhaps it's most recognizable in not offering a comment or being silent. But more importantly, we can replace the word complicity with collaboration. Collaboration is a far more accurate word to me because one can be complicit in a passive way. And to those whose ears need to hear this message of com that of complicity, they might at first construe complicity as some kind of tacit culpability, some kind of accidental um, affiliation with what's going on. But collaboration for me is unequivocally active because none of us can pretend ignorance of the ordering, dehumanizing violence of racecraft that we feel on a daily basis, especially after uprisings like, like last, um, last summer's. The question we then might want to interrogate if we believe that we have a conscience is collaboration to what? In the 60s, Zinn's metaphorical train was headed in deadly directions, as he, as he said. In today's times, we could say it has certainly arrived and we are very much living through the multiple and intersecting crises we face as a species, whether that's climate devastation, poverty and malnutrition, child trafficking and modern slavery, war, mental health or that, or that of intimate violence. Most modern crises find their root in the legal, political, and economic setup of modern society. That is to say they are the fruit of a structural rot, a globalizing asymmetry of power, one which scholar and activist Bell Hooks names the imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy. The ideological pinnings of each regime named providing the logic which drives every aforementioned crisis. But actually, knowing is not enough. And the things I've said here, I'm sure, were read by a thousand Guardian readers who went on to do precisely nothing because the provocation here is not savvy enough, the one that silences complicity, especially when we think about the current state of anti-racism, because the days of Zinn and, and King, um, and when we, when we would say 13 dead and nothing said, those days are gone. And this is, this is Web 2.0 and we're living in a different kind of time. So it might do well to reflect on um, 
the incisive critique of a, a brilliant writer and thinker and activist, and her name is Sita Bellani. Um, and she wrote uh, an article recently called uh, Statement Fever. And I'm going to paraphrase a bit from the article because I think it's really apt for this, for this conversation. Press releases, Instagram stories, black squares, tweets, acknowledgements, apologies, apologies for apologies, donations, promises to do better, promises to make change, promises to do the work. Corporations, organizations, and public institutions have statement fever. The lesson here, of course, is far more profound than the recognition that organizations say one thing and do another. What is becoming visible is the deep imbrication of race in the organization of society. It is becoming increasingly difficult to deny that capitalism is racial capitalism. These organizations cannot work for racial justice because they need to devalue some labor, the labor of those who are racialized in order to make money. And that makes me think of, uh, of a Shakespeare quote where he says, the empty vessel makes the loudest sound. So rather than be condemned as complicit, either with um, ill judge goodwill or with cynical self gain at the heart, brands, influences, all the people who we might be com you know, compelling to no longer be silent, um, have actually condemned silence. And they've donned black squares and they've written heartfelt statuses and they've promised to never stay silent. So we actually live in a time where that, that's kind of old, you know, everyone knows that. They know they're not supposed to stay silent. And in fact, they all think they have something to say. So in this far more animated situ situation, does silence is complicity, what does it mean? It means that statement fever, that white noise is just as bad, or maybe even worse than silence. It means that the opposite of silence is not simply to be outspoken. It means that to break the collaboration, we need to do more than just simply be outspoken. We need to do as a um, scholar and activist and, and longtime revolutionary thinker and an incredible writer, Robin D.G. Kelly, recently disclosed he does. He says, we need to love, study and struggle. To me, this means the following. Love as in let our daily practice with one another be one of radical rehumanizing in the face of all this dehumanizing that I've spoken about, of understanding, of generosity to ourselves as well as to others, of gentleness with people and planet, of spiritual growth as Bell Hooks speak about when she speaks about a return to love as the revolutionary dream. Study as in a deep commitment to revolutionary theory, to unlearning and deepening, to engaging deeply with the pedagogy of insurgent ideologies and movements such as that of Black Lives Matter, but also from Black feminist communisms to Zapatismo to, to all the underdogs that are fighting back against this asymmetry of power and sh finally struggle as in organizing to materialize people power in the workplace, in the estate, in the home, in the streets. Most of us are not silent in a way where we are ideologically driven to do so. Most of us in, in, in Britain are uncertain about what the Black Lives Matter movement spells because we're ruled by racist propagandists in parliament as in press. Most of us on this island actually have common interests and realizing this means to take a stand. Re realizing these things means to take a stand and to discard a life of silence and collaboration with the regime of racial capitalism and instead to embark on a life of love, study and struggle. Thank you very much, uh, Joshua, for your speech. Uh, we don't have any questions for you uh, right now at the moment, but they may come later. Uh, just a reminder to all our speakers on the call, if you'd like to ask any questions of each other, you're more than welcome to do so um, at the end or during uh, a speech. Um, but we'll move on now to our first speaker for the opposition tonight. Uh, our first speaker is Remy Adekoa. Uh, Remy is a writer, journalist and political scientist of Polish-Nigerian descent. He has written for The Guardian, Spectator, Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, Washington Post and Politico, among others. His Biracial Britain, A Different Way of Looking at Race was published last year. Remy is back by popular appeal, having spoken at the Union uh, late last year. Good evening, Cambridge. <clears throat> Thank you for inviting me to address this house tonight. <clears throat> I'd like to start by saying that when it comes to an issue as complex, emotional and consequential as race, I believe we should approach all well-meaning debates, I repeat, well-meaning debates, not as battlegrounds to decide victor and vanquished, but as opportunities to deepen our understanding of all the various perspectives out there. Understanding is the first step to empathy, and empathy makes all cruelty, including the incredible cruelty of racism, 
that more difficult to practice. In this spirit, I must acknowledge here that I truly understand the anti-racist strategy of seeking to apply maximum moral pressure on white people to proactively tackle racism in Western societies. After all, out of every 100 people who live in Britain, 85 are white, which means it is physically impossible to effectively tackle racism targeted at the 15% minority population without overwhelming support from Britain's white inhabitants. That much is clear. Furthermore, I must say that although I tried hard for the purposes of this debate, because I'm supposed to be opposing the motion, I could not summon in myself any significant moral opposition to tonight's debate proposition that silence is complicity in cases where we see racism and just move on like nothing happened. Though I've personally had very positive experiences here in Britain, back when I lived in Poland, my mother's country of birth, I had way too many experiences of racist abuse hurled at me publicly on a bus or train to the deafening silence of all around. You're on your own was the message I got, a depressing message indeed. And so I'll focus tonight not on the moral value of this house's proposition, but on some of the practical consequences it is fostering in the particular time, place, and context we live in. As a consequentialist, I'm way more focused on actual outcomes than stated intentions. In today's world, where public debate is increasingly driven by social media, I think one unhelpful consequence of insisting silence is complicity is the encouragement of an excessive amount of white virtue signaling that can often seem more concerned with being seen as anti-racist than with actually tackling racism's real life consequences. During the protest following George Floyd's killing last summer, a white friend of mine who works in the PR department of a company told me how his white boss would remind him every morning to make sure you tweet something supporting BLM today because that's what our woke young clients want to see. However, when my friend asked his boss whether their firm would be looking to increase the tiny number of senior level employees of color it had, he had a lengthy speech about how complicated that would be. Till today, nothing has changed on this front in that firm, yet it remains vocally anti-racist on its social media accounts. The emphasis on what is said is so strong these days, you can cover up not doing much by saying a lot. But words can be as useless as silence if they are not doing anything to actually better reality. It would be fair for me to explain at this point where exactly I think there should be more doing and less talking. In my view, 21st century racism is the primordial manifestation of a global class system. I think Marx was correct in his core argument that it is the material which determines the ideological, not the other way around. The world's unspoken yet highly consequential racial hierarchy faithfully reflects its economic hierarchy. The key fact being that in collective terms, the white racial group remains significantly wealthier than other racial groups. The GDP of Africa's 54 nations put together is smaller than the GDP of Britain. To put this in perspective, Africa is home to 1.3 billion people and 90% of the world's black population, 90%. The proposers of tonight's motion could argue here that these are precisely the kind of things we need to be loudly discussing, namely how did this incredible wealth gap come about? Yes, it is definitely important people learn that the current economic status quo was arrived at brutally and unjustly. But no matter how many times we recall the history of slavery, colonialism, and Western imperialism, this won't change the material realities on the ground. Moral arguments won't reduce poverty levels in Africa or South Asia, nor create wealth there. They won't eliminate the wealth and resultant power gap that is the most influential factor shaping interracial dynamics today. This gap is accurately reflected in our local British context as well. While the median white British family is worth 282,000 pounds, the median Caribbean family is worth 89,000 pounds, whereas the median black African family is worth just 24,000 pounds. The average white British family thus owns three times the wealth of the average Caribbean family and 12 times the wealth of the average black African family. This material gap is not conducive to balanced race relations. 
It makes too many black and brown destinies dependent on white action and white goodwill. It creates a reality in which white Westerners regularly observe on their TV screens large numbers of black and brown skinned people risking their lives to cross the Mediterranean Sea, desperate to get into Europe. This breeds a sadly all too human contempt and sense of superiority among many white Westerners who may not say this out loud, but who both consciously and subconsciously see this as proof their societies are clearly better than others. The sad fact is that posting anti-racist messages won't change these material realities. I'm not saying words don't matter, they do. I'm not saying moral arguments don't matter, they do. History matters too. But it is important we realize that talking about racism is at best just the start of a beginning. Racism thrives where the capacity to dominate exists. That is why it is the prejudices of those more powerful than us that we fear most. The key to eliminating racism on a global scale lies not in getting as many white people as possible to condemn it, but in eliminating the capacity of white people to dominate other groups in the first place. That way, ending racism stops being a choice. White people get to decide whether to make or not. It becomes a reality they have no choice but to accept. This might seem a very long-term solution, but it is the only real solution. Otherwise, we'll spend the next few centuries trying to cajole white people into not being racist. So to all the well-meaning white folk out there, and I know there are many of you, if you really want to fight racism, please focus your energies on trying to figure out how to close that racial wealth gap, on how to eliminate your capacity to dominate. Then you won't have to deal with the temptation to dominate. This will require real sacrifices on your part, but real change costs. So to sum up, if you feel so inclined, by all means, speak, debate, and agitate against racism. But if you're unsure about what to say or how to say it, then feel free to stay silent. Instead, quietly send me an email with your ideas for how to reduce the wealth gap between racial groups both here in Britain and on a global scale. For this is the only way we'll make racism not just immoral, but downright impossible. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, uh, Remy, for your speech. Um, we will move on to our uh, third speaker tonight uh, and our second speaker for the proposition. Um, and our second speaker is a student speaker, um, Abiola Agbara. Abiola is a student of human, social and political sciences at Lucy Cavendish College, um, as well as an academic school representative in the Cambridge Student Union. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I would firstly like to express my gratitude for being given the opportunity to speak here at the Cambridge Union, where so many intellectuals have and will continue to speak after me in a union which was founded on the invaluable virtue of the freedom of speech. Now, on this notion of the virtue of speech, humankind has been bespoke the power of a mind, which is the faculty for all conscious consciousness and thought and expression is the medium by which we are able to release these ideas into the world. Speech itself is a double-edged sword and it commands an authority which brings down walls, builds up nations and changes the hearts of many. As Frank Fanon perfectly puts it, the living expression of the nation is the collective consciousness in motion of the entire people. Now whilst the presence of speech holds power, its absence is ever more deafening. This is an epiphany that holds true in a myriad of cases, and the history of colonialism is a phenomenon which perfectly epitomises this statement. By the end of the 20th century, empires had fallen and almost all nations were nominally granted independence, signifying the demise of colonialism. This, of course, was merely in theory. Colonial presence did not confine its impact strictly to the time period in which it formally manifested itself, but has rather left the scars of its political, economic and epistemic legacy, which are all deeply entrenched. Today, we are left with the systematic subjugation of those who don't fit into the criteria of the white supremacist agenda. We face neo-colonialism through political turmoil that troubles and debilitates Africa and the rest of the global south. The perceived structures of political power in these regions are feeble and constantly under threat with the instability of governmental policy, the rise of insurgency and militant non-state actors, the toppling of 
governments and implementation of puppet tyrants, all of which cannot be delinked from Western interference and agenda. Economically, Africa in particular has been constantly plundered and looted of its wealth and resources for the sake of building up the rest of the world when it's back. It has been operating under a smokescreen by which in reality it has been underdeveloped and the conditions engineered throughout colonialism have instituted the dependency of the continent and its people in a system of the Western global order. Perhaps most important of them all is the epistemic legacy by which the, the, most, area, the most important area of domination was the mental universe of the colonized with knowledge being deemed as a dangerous weapon because it encompassed how people perceive themselves and their relationship to the world. Colonialism and Western mastery served to silence knowledge and the psyche of the colonized was a workshop by which the notions of an inferiority complex, degeneracy and human inhumanity was embedded. Now, it is granted that those who take up the position of power will strive to pre preserve these status quo and it is almost unnatural to willingly give up a power that is systematically orchestrated to serve you. It is hardly difficult to get complacent and comfortable in one's privilege, and as W.E.B. Du Bois famously quotes, a system cannot fail those it was never meant to protect. So on these grounds, I am not claiming that we can subvert these inherent systems at the click of a finger, for they are deeply seated and ingrained, but that does not excuse the fact that we must still acknowledge these structures and call evil by its name. We must unlearn and relearn, and this is where the national curriculum has an indispensable duty to play. Information is controlled, and I'd firmly go as far to say that this very thing that we call reality itself is controlled by the unseen powers of the upper echelons of this global world order that we call home. Nevertheless, we are in an era where globalization has unleashed forces that allow knowledge to be transferred so seamlessly and distorted as it may be, we are still in an age of information. The ages, the ages that are dedicated to consuming knowledge from these institutions of education are some of the most precious, for these are the ages where young people are able to form opinions, predispositions, and ultimately forge an identity that carries us through the future chapters of our lives. This is why the curriculum is an instrument for change, and it is imperative that it is decolonized. The undeniable school curriculum is flawed in many ways, and whilst it glorifies certain fields of academia, it starkly turns a blind eye to others. Why is it that we are indoctrinated to celebrate the history of state-sponsored atrocities, mass genocides and global attempts at self-destruction through wars that have been instigated by the West? More importantly, why have these devastating events been warped and packaged with narratives of victory and as beacons of strength, achievement and patriotism? If the West is to celebrate such historic moments that it deems as a source of pride, then it must accept and proclaim and speak on its history in all of its totality. It must not reconstruct and rebrand its history by nullifying and burying those things which can no longer be applauded, but rather it must teach its imperial legacy, no matter how ugly it gets. To see modernity outside of the colonial transnational relations that have manufactured it is to not see modernity for what it truly is at all. In fact, to try and understand the world outside the matrix of coloniality is to perpetuate the Eurocentric lens of the world, which has caused us to become so desensitized to violence, oppression and tyranny. Without the decolonization of the curriculum, many of the young are led to view the world through rose tinted glasses and left to navigate the world under false pretenses. I am an embodiment of the masses of young people who have an abundance of thought and unique perspectives to offer. So let us allow the minds of the young to be fertile grind, ground for the seed of paradigm shifts. And when we speak out, let us not be bullied into silence, but be honored for exercising a moral human right of passage. <laughs> Silence is violence. By choosing to allow the souls of those who are victims to go unnoticed is to strip them from any semblance of power. And as the great proverb by the novelist Chinua Achebe says, until lions have their own historians, the history of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So to erase knowledge of this matter is an aggression of its own. Silence is betrayal. We all have a moral obligation to speak up and shed light on the issue of injustice simply for the sake of the shared humanity. There is no us versus them, but humanity against evil, thus we cannot afford to be divided. 
It is our cross to bear and we must speak out even if our voice shakes. Silence is complicity. By choosing to hold one's tongue in the midst of oppression is to declare one's alliance with the oppressor. <laughs> Whilst there is so much beauty in the diversity of opinion in many other conversations, the immorality of colonialism is simply not one of those things that are up for contestation. Neutrality in a case like this is falsehood. For this union to oppose the unveiling of the tragedies of the past, which covertly continue till this day, is to oppose the very foundations of the union itself, which is the freedom of speech. Life and death are in the power of the tongue, so let us use this power wisely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Abiola, for your speech. Um, we have one question uh, directed to us uh, tonight, um, but I think this could be um, directed at actually any of our uh, speakers, perhaps Joshua or Remy, if you wanted to come on in this. Uh, the question is, is racism in its institutional forms the same wherever we find it, or does it change with different geographical and temporal contexts? Uh, you might need to unmute Remy. I think I think clearly it changes. So I understand from the question when they say a racism, they're talking about white racism. So of course it's a little bit different everywhere. I think it's a little bit different in Brazil. It's a little bit different in Britain. It's a little bit different in Russia. It's a little bit different in Poland or Ukraine. Uh, so there's a, the various sort of levels of uh, intensity of it. So you know, just to answer that question, sort of to sum up, I think it does vary. It does vary depending on the context. Depending, you know, I'm very much into looking at sort of you know the power dynamics between groups. And, uh, and a lot of this, I believe, is determined by the socioeconomic situation of groups um, collectively. And so I think, you know, the more sort of power the dominant group has, the more you will see of that kind of racism, the more there'll be a temptation to sort of abuse that power and, 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 and treat people badly. So, for instance, in a place like Poland, where I live, where there's, I don't know, maybe 50,000 um, black or brown skinned people in the whole country of 38 million, uh, then obviously, you know, we essentially had no say there and we're not really able to fight racism because, you know, there's so few of us that there was nothing really we could do about it. The UK is different. At least 15% of the population is black or brown skin. So there's a, there's a different demographic dynamic there. So a lot depends on the power dynamics between the groups. I think the only thing I'd add is that, um, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Like uh, race, race and racecraft is a technology and it's wielded by different um, colonialists, settler colonialists, different governments at different, at different times. But the, the forms of racialization, there are similarities and it's, it's important to remark on those. And there's a, a scholar called Patrick Wolfe who's written a lot about the contrasting and looking at the similarities between the different forms of racism and especially set in settler colonial context. And one of the important things for me about being able to see the similarities is being able to forge solidarities and racialize people across the world, being able to connect the dots. You know, there was Black Panthers in, in, in the States, but there was Black Panthers in Aotearoa in, in, uh, in New Zealand. And there was, there was a lot of uh, understanding the logic of racecraft and how it works across the world and being able to see its similarities is very important. But it, of course, it's very different and it, and it mutates and it changes. And even, even what we understand to be black and brown changes as, as racecraft changes. So, yeah, good question. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Remy and Josh, for your um, answers to that question. Um, and thanks uh, to anyone who's uh, submitting questions in the audience. A reminder that you can uh, follow the link below in our description. Uh, and of course, anybody else in this call can ask questions of our speakers too. Um, right, we will move on with the substantives um, of the debate tonight um, and on to our fourth speaker uh, tonight and our second speaker for the opposition, uh, Saren Mahari. Uh, Saren is a second year history and modern languages student at Gonville and Keys College and the current president of the Cambridge African and Caribbean Society. Uh, Saren, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Okay, so in archetypal definitions and depictions of heroism, it's usually only the loudest, the smartest, the prettiest, the strongest, the bravest that are accepted and pretty much any other superlative with S that you can think of at the end. Often in order to occupy those spaces of the hero or the savior or the protagonist, you cannot be silent. I mean, what is being a hero if you aren't armed with the loudest, most eccentric costume, the perfect monologue and a cloud of smoke and glitter, and in this case, the perfect TikTok or infographic to go along with it. Usually anything short of that, you are considered a coward and a liability to the cause. But when it comes 
to activism and social justice, I really think that this line of thinking has got to be amongst some of the most toxic and dangerous. This concept that silence is inherent complicity that is now framing new age activism is really, um, I think it's actually inadvertently causing damage to such movements. It partially makes you complicit in reifying certain structures of institu institutional racism, as well as cheapening the power of um, just actually doing the work required to bring about lasting change. The implications of capitalism, of neoliberalism, and the general commodification of activism that we, we are seeing, especially in the 21st century, has meant that us as a society are centering ourselves in the act of protest. Um, that whilst we are trying to kind of undo these centuries of oppression and discrimination, it has become a bit of an egotistical act. By fixating on silence, we forget to ask ourselves who is being allowed to speak, what is being said, and when will there actually be action that um, is to follow suit and by arguing this way we are creating a generation of what i'd say is the bare minimum nothing short of cheap talk and essentially kind of checklist activism and sadly that prevents real lasting change from from coming about now something i kind of want to bring up um just from hearing um the kind of structure of the debate so far is this idea of neutrality that is being kind of um, reinforced by the um by the proposition I think that it's really important to kind of not equate silence and neutrality. I think there's a way in which silence can be active and can, um, which I will kind of go into, but it, it, there is a way in which the overglorification of speech and, and kind of how Remy phrased it of white noise um, is just overall really weakening um, actions and it's also placing an equal responsibility on society when society doesn't operate in in an equal spectrum there's people with privileges whether it be financial economic economic um, industrial racial and therefore kind of applying this moral wand on everyone in the same way doesn't work and it's really important that we kind of understand who we're giving who we are you know accusing of being complicit when they are silent and for what reason um now i want to kind of keep going off the top of that i'm off the back of that um thinking back on the grandfather injustice of 2017 that really just shook our nation it was a site um that really really exposed racial injustice class injustice and the way in which the lives of black and brown people refugees really didn't count for much in the eyes of the government um i think the way in which activism and social justice occurred there wasn't about who is speaking, it's about who was doing. We saw um, charities and commissions have said that over 25 million pounds was raised just nationally, internationally from people deciding to give. There was no judgment as to who was speaking, how long were they speaking, who was putting up the nicest infographics. And I think that the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, we did see this, um, the way in which this, this, this motif of silence, this complicity really took charge and really hindered actual action from occurring. We saw with um, the aftermath of Grenfell, people coming from Birmingham, people coming from Manchester come in, like to, to really bring about the restorative change that the government and that these big, you know, huge industries, huge councils, huge um, institutions were not bringing about. How can we judge the si their silence and the silence of all, all the, the, you know, the lack of kind of outward speaking. How can we, of, of, a, of an individual from North Kensington, how can they be equated? How can we equate the, the, the silence of an underprivileged person and the silence of someone who has the power to bring about complete change? I think that's something that really has to be considered. And now kind of going back to the idea of um, the Black Lives Matter movement, or what I kind of like to call in terms of uh, when dissecting activism during that period, um, the plague of the black squares, it was reported that 28 million users had put up black squares in solidarity with, with the movement, which is great. You saw multi-million corporations, you know, providing all of these ad, ad campaigns and um, promising to give such amount of money. We saw um, Nike offering to give 40 million over the case of, over the space of 10 years. We saw um, just all these kind of institutions deciding to, to bring about change, but at what cost? Yes, they were not silent. Yes, they chose to spoke out and in excess, in excess, they chose to spoke out. But at the end of the day, last year, 164 black people were killed in the US within the first eight months. It didn't change the fact that in this country, black people are still nine times more likely to be stop and search with an 85% likelihood of charges. It didn't change the fact that 1,774 black people have been killed in police 
custody since 1990 and 40,555 40, black and brown refugees have died since 1990 attempting to enter the EU alone. So clearly, yes, we are in the age where we have noise, we have the, the most perfect, seemingly perfect form of activism where everyone has access to knowledge, everyone has access to the, the infrastructure and the books and how to have the right conversations and how to speak to the institutions and how to speak to the black people in the right way, but at what cost? The this is how I'm trying to display the way in which the, glor in which the glorification of of speech in its excess and in ways that's not directed, in ways that's not action focused, is actually causing more bad than good. Even in the way in which we look at history and kind of ideas of liberation and freedom, the, the tendency to encourage everyone to speak and to speak in excess means that there is uh, an opposing kind of force of erasure, that not, everyone, not everyone's narrative is still being heard. If we look at the way in which, for example, the abolition movement has always been put forward to us, it's always been, you know, speaking out, yes, in favour of abolition, how great it is and how awful um, the transatlantic slave trade was, but it's always been through the lens of the white saviour. It's always been about William Wilberforce. It's always been about the Quakers and what they were doing um, in the United Kingdom to, to, to stop, um, you know, one of the man's biggest ills, um, and I think there's a way in which that has caused a lot more harm than good. And I think there's a way that in which by breaking our fixation, our obsession with silent, uh, with, with just choosing to speak outright, that there's a, way, there's a way in which that can be done in order to focus the, the black voice, in order to focus the likes of um, Toussaint Louverture in the Haitian Revolution of 1791. There's a way in which we can talk about the writings of Osaba Kuguano, who was a contemporary of Equiano. We can talk about the likes of Sojourner Truth. We can talk about Mary Prince and Phyllis Wheatley. I think there's a way in which we need to decide that who has the power to speak and whose voice is important if we are really trying to bring about change and freedom and liberation in the right way. Even in the way we talk about decolonization, Abiola spoke a lot about that and, and kind of the, the impacts of that. Through what lens are we looking at it? It's all well and good. And, and even, you know, post-war revelations of decolonization, um, most, most governments were very anti-empire, were very willing to kind of have the winds of change moment like uh, Macmillan had in his, in his speech in the 50s. Everyone was willing to have that conversation, but no one was looking at it from the lens of, the people on the ground, the African people. Nobody was speaking a bit about, you know, movements, movements of liberation, revolution from the perspective of the Battle of Adwa, the Mau Mau Rebellion, the Algerian War of Independence. And I think there's a way in which if we are really going to try and center the narrative of people, we can't be having arbitrary conversations and arbitrary, everyone is allowed to speak without knowing the facts, without dedicating themselves to work and to education. I think to judge someone by how loud they scream, by how many infographics they post, how many conversations they're willing to have is to completely miss the importance of activism. It's a cop-out response against systems and, dis and institutions that have historically and continue to destroy, silence and kill. To argue that silence is complicity is to kind of admit that you might not be willing to do the work beyond the hashtags, the talks and the raising awareness, that you would rather appear to be kind of doing the most um, on pla in platforms and amongst other people, even if it involves silencing and speaking over the disenfranchised. There are organisations to join, there are funds to donate to, there are campaigns to be initiated, schools to go and visit, charities that need to be, volu that need volunteers, sorry. You can do all those things silently. Those are not things you need to announce that everybody needs to know that you're doing and there have been a generation of people before us that we will never know their names we will never know their actions but they contributed to huge movements that single-handedly allow me to speak here that allow me to be in certain positions that i would never be into they didn't need to announce those things um, and that is the power of active silence not neutral silence not complicit silence that's the power of active silence and so voting in favor of the prop proposition means that you uh, not necessarily directly, but there is a there is a complicit like there is a way in which you are erasing a generation of activism and social justice that is built upon actually walking the walk and not just talking the talk. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Saren, for your speech. Um, I will pass over to our um, final speaker for the proposition tonight, uh, Kahindi Andrews. Uh, Kahindi is a professor of Black Studies at Birmingham City University. His research focuses on resistance to racism and grassroots organisations. His books include Black to Black, Retelling Black Radicalism for the 21st Century, and Resisting Racism, Race, Inequality, and the Black Supplementary School Movement in 2013. Uh, Kahindi, you have our ears. Uh, yes, good evening. Um, so no, thank you for this. I've been listening uh, intently and anybody who's heard me speak before will be surprised. I'm actually going to start with a Martin Luther King quote. Um, I'm usually a Malcolm man, but I might bring in Malcolm later, later on. And the quote from uh, King is, the greatest tragedy of this period was not the strident clamour of the bad people, but the appalling silence of the good people. Right, silence has had this, this idea of silence is complicity. It does not come uh, from now, it does not come from BLM, it does not come through virtue signaling. There is a long tradition of this idea that speaking up is, is absolutely essential uh, if we're talking about dealing with injustice. I would also just say that we've really have conflated the idea with being public and with being silent. And King makes that quote, he's not saying you need to go out and you don't even have uh, social media at that point. He's not saying you need to go out and be open and, and let everybody know what you're, what you're doing. He's saying that actually to give money to a cause, to, to do those things which we've given examples of in the background, that, that's not silence, actually. That's this public and silence are two very different things I think we need to be very, very clear about. Um, I would also say that nobody on our side of the house would be saying that virtue, virtue signal is a good thing at all. Right. I mean, there's the idea that just speaking is good. Uh, I, don't, that's, I don't think there's ever been something um, which, which anybody would say is, is, a, is a positive thing. Uh, Donald Trump had, um, had a very loud voice, um, and I, but I don't think we would say that was a, was, was a positive in the, in the idea of racism um, and in how to combat racism. At least. So I would having said that, you know, I, I did use a Martin Luther King quote, but I do have to be a little bit critical because I think within that quote, we can also see some of the problems uh, with this idea, though, because actually what King outlines here is the the bad people and the good people, right? And this is a really kind of Christian morality tale that there are good people and there are bad people. And if only the good people would speak up, uh, the bad people would be constrained. And this is really the worst way to think about the problem of racism, which is not about good people and bad people. It is actually, as, as Remy pointed out, about a system which is based on white supremacy, where black life resources um, labor is perfectly fine to be exploited so that we can build uh, everything that we have today in the West, right? That's the problem. The problem is not people. The problem is systems. And this is a really important way when we think about this. We're actually in this discussion then. So when we, when I say certainly, when we say that silence is complicity. This is not about the, the rights and the wrongs of the individual. This is not about judging the individual at all because this is not an individual problem. This is very much a systemic problem. And it is a systemic problem, which, again, I think we'd all 100% agree, cannot be dealt with with PR, brand exercises, with the black squares and all that nonsense. I mean, that, that's clearly something which doesn't, which is about individual feeling better rather than about trying to tackle the problem of racism. Um, I would also just point out, come, coming to some of these examples that we've had here, uh, Grenfell, I mean, Grenfell may have had a, may have silent marches, but it is not an example of silence. Grenfell is a perfect example of making noise, right? Grenfell brings lots and lots of attention to the issue of neoliberalism and racism and how that plays out with the death of um, countless lives generally. But that's not silent. I mean, the, 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 the idea that that silence tells us we don't really understand the concept of silence. That's a, that's a lot of noise being brought to an issue which otherwise would not have been talked about. Um, BLM in the same way. I mean, I have been and still am critical of, of some of the politics of, of, Black, of Black Lives Matter and tends to be quite liberal, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's issues and there's certainly different, there's certainly parts of uh, people within the movement um, who probably are virtue signaling. But we're talking about the issues of uh, racial capitalism. We're talking about issues of mass incarceration. We're talking about issues of police violence against Black people, both here and around the world. And we simply would not have been talking, we weren't talking about that before, right? I mean, that's the perfect example of bringing attention to an issue. And if you don't bring attention to issues, then guess what? Those issues are never addressed. And the judgment here cannot be, have those issues been addressed effectively? Because that's not really what we're talking about, right? The issue here is, can, what, how do you have to bring attention to these issues to address them? And then there is a secondary question about how we address them. But if we basically, if we just said that, well, you know, 
speech. If it doesn't, if it doesn't work, then it's not val valid. Then we would have to cross over Martin Luther King. We have to cross over the civil rights movement because guess what? 50 years after the civil rights movement, we still have all the same problems, right? So the argument here isn't whether it's successful. The argument here is um, if you don't speak out, and speak out can mean lots of things. Bring attention to be part of movements to change. Then you are complicit. Um, I would also add. Uh, really like to push this idea that this is not about trying to get well about well-meaning white people it's not about all, all voices there also is silence there is also is silence in some of these campaigns which are very outspoken uh, this is an important point i think we brought up the anti-abolition the anti sorry the abolition movement the abolition movement is a perfect example of where you have a campaign which is is, is good in lots of ways right abolition of slavery but also includes lots of violence and silence within it the silencing of the black voices, as um, the previous speaker mentioned. Um, the fact that actually <laughs> many of the ab abolitionists took the stage in blackface to make their to make their arguments for uh, freeing the enslaved, they had blackface and just completely um, weren't against racism, they were just against slavery. After abolition happened in this country, there's been a lot of celebration about how great abolition was and how what proud we should be, et cetera, et cetera. But the nation was happy to take slave produced uh, sugar and cotton for, for decades, right? So there's still complicity and silence there, right? And this is really important because when we're thinking about now and we're thinking about some of the campaigns about the material issues that we have now, something like fair trade, again, lots of people, vocal, fair trade, the whole concept of fair trade is completely nonsensical given that the massive imbalances in the global economy, right? The idea that you could even have fair trade is, is completely ridiculous, right? Um, but this is a material reality. And I agree again with Remy. Me and Remy agree a lot of this, that the issue is the material problem. And the material of the, of, of the material position which we find ourselves in is not, nothing of uh, the racism. We have a global, in a, a global uh, system where Sub-Saharan Africa, sub whole called Sub-Saharan Africa is the poorest, white place is the richest, and there's a hierarchy in between. I mean, that is white supremacy. But, and this is where the silence issue comes into, we have uh, a framework of understanding that which never talks about race. The United Nations, which has development goals, which is supposed to be tasked with solving global poverty, never talks about the biggest issue, which is racism. And you can't deal with that by being silent. There's no way to deal with that, with, that, with, that, with, with being silent. And on the issue of complicity, the simple, sad, unfortunate truth is that we are all complicit in this system. This isn't a historical thing which has just happened and been the case. This is a very present thing which happens today because of these global imbalances, which, you know, the legacy of those of slavery colonialism, etc. But the actual the book I just published is The New Age of Empire, which lays out how this is still the case today. Tens of millions, probably hundreds of millions of people live in conditions which are very similar to what their ancestors lived in 100 years ago because the global economy is still based on the idea that we can uh, extract the resources, life, labor from black and brown people. And just to give you a statistic here, a child dies every 10 seconds because they have access, no, no proper access to food. Like that's a, every, so in the hour that we've been speaking, 360 dead black and brown children, they're dead, they're gone, right? Because of the wealth which we have extracted from them. You are complicit, this is, I am complicit. And if we don't ex understand our complicity, that we do actually genuinely have blood on our hands. We can only have this discussion over these wonderful uh, Zoom, and these, whether you're on a smartphone or a laptop, because of those children, then we are never going to be able to solve the problem. This is why uh, silence is complicity. And I agree 100% that just talking and just saying this and just knowing this is not enough. But it is the start, right? There's no way to address this if you don't understand it particularly when we have so many voices telling us everything's okay, that things aren't racist, that we're making progress, whether that be in the government, whether that be in um, uh, people like Bill Gates, whether it be whoever it is that's telling us everything's fine, the first point is to, is to acknowledge our complicity. And we should be uncomfortable, all of us, not just white people, all of us who are here should be uncomfortable from the fact that our prosperity relies on the death of children. And once we accept that, that is the first point to saying, what do we do about it? There is no way to deal with any of these problems if we are silent, but we are all complicit. Thank you very, very much, uh, Kahindi, for your speech. Uh, we have one more question, uh, which uh, could be directed to any of our uh, speakers tonight, but Kahindi, perhaps you might want to come in on this one. Um, it's an anonymous question, 
Um, and um, this person has said, it's been fascinating to hear about how much Marx and Marxism has anchored the responses of, of, of many speakers tonight. Um, there have been a few appeals to Fanon and Dubois. The most important um, intellectual of the 20th century. And I'd recommend that everybody listens to the ballot or the bullet, because that speech will explain what's going on today better than anything I've heard um, since or, or before. Great, thank you. Um, right, we'll move on to our final speaker uh, for tonight uh, and our last speaker on the opposition. Um, that's Sunda Kutwala. Sunda is the director of the think tank of the British Future. He has previously uh, been general secretary of the Fabian Society think tank from 2003 to 2011, a leader um, and internet editor at The Observer, a research director of the Foreign Policy Center and commissioning editor for politics and economics at the publisher Macmillan. Uh, Sunda, you have our ears. Thanks, thank you for the invitation to come and talk about racism in Cambridge tonight. Um, it's been a virtual debate and so we haven't been able to be in the debating chamber and I think um, while that's a shame I think it's also a, a good thing that we've had um, you know a conversation here with a lot of nuance and this is not an adversarial debate there are agreements and disagreements uh, between people here who are committed to anti-racism and have a range of different views with some common ground I hope as well about how to pursue how to pursue that cause. So um, I think that's been a, a good feature of, of tonight's debate. Um, British Future, the think tank I run, is interested in having public conversations about the issues that people find difficult and polarising, immigration, identity, race, integration, because if you try to do that, you can sometimes find common ground and move on. So I've spent a lot of time this year talking to people about racism, their experience of the protests last summer and what they meant to people who were on them, people who supported them, people who weren't sure about them and were hesitant about them, people who um, didn't like them, about what, what was driving that, as well as other conversations about what's been going on during the pandemic and how it's changed what we want to happen to our society as we as we reconnect. So I think I think that's an important basis on which to have this conversation about how we take forward anti-racism, how we how we broaden the, the cause, how we broaden the movement, what persuades people to do that. So is silence complicity? Um, this is an argument about a principle, about when we have an obligation and when it might be good if we act, but we don't have an obligation. But this is also a conversation about the strategy, the message, the slogans of anti-racism, about what it is that encourages and activates people to speak up and to engage or to act in ways that matter. On the principle, um, I think um, sometimes yes, but mostly no, in terms of is silence complicity. Yes, when you have approximate, immediate, responsibility. If you are there um, and there is a hate crime in front of you, bystanders should be upstanders. And to fail to stand up in that case is a failure. It's an ethical failure. If, you know, you know, in the most serious crimes, you know, the uh, two of the six people who murdered Stephen Lawrence were finally convicted many years ago, but other people were silent in a way that made them complicit for that. Crime. And in other ways as well, um, um, we saw this week the the holiday park firm Pontins. They had a you know they had a list with traveller names and Irish names on it. And your job was to refuse the booking and to find an excuse to refuse the booking because of somebody's surname. If you participated in the system and you didn't challenge it, then you were participating. You were active. So I think in these cases where you have a direct obligation, I think it is true that to be silent or to not act is to fail. But as a more general principle about the state of our society, I think it's good to speak up. Voice can matter if it's useful. But I, I'm sceptical of the idea that we that we make that work by insisting on an obligation. Because silence um, is silence complicity. Silence, Josh said, is a spectrum. Um, and I think that's right. Silence is silence. And silence can mean a great many different things. Silence might be um, cowardly or craven and frightened to speak when it knows it should, but silence might be useful. Silence might be solemn. It might be listening. It might be thinking and contemplating. It might be a prelude to action that we want to see, a prelude to speak. Or silence might be um, distracted, too busy, 
aware that something is going on in our peripheral division, uh, division but not yet able to pay enough time. We're all silent about things we should probably speak more about. I don't say a vast amount, maybe as I should, about climate change or about uh, you know wars in different parts of the world or protests that are going on because I don't yet know about them. And it's in a way there's a potential exhaustion in the level of moral expectation we have to engage everywhere with everything and speak. So I think there are dangers in ca characterizing silence as problematic, even if we want people to speak up and we want more people to speak up. So what we need to do above all, I think, is try and have conversation with those who are hesitant. We'll have to get the silent to speak to us about which form of silence it is that they are currently in so that we can engage with. So we want to have a conversation with people who are already marching, holding placards, coming out, you know, being mournful, being active, being engaged. We also want to have a conversation with people who have seen that happening and haven't yet decided whether to join in to find out what it is that might that might make them appeal. And I think central to this debate about the slogan or the message or the argument science of complicity is, will we make progress if we increase people's discomfort about race and racism and injustice? And I think Kendra has just given us a powerful case actually of saying, yes, yes, we might do that. That might be a really important way to do it. But on the whole, I think that will fail as often as it works. And I think the discomfort in talking about race is one of the big reasons that we have an avoidance about race. And so I think what we should be doing in this society is trying to decrease the discomfort and increase the confidence of talking about race in a society that hasn't got that confidence yet but I think could find it. About one in 20 people um, were not white, black, Asian, mixed race, um, you know, when I was um, at university and leaving university. It's one in six now. So an increasingly diverse society such as ours is going to have to get more confident about a topic that people find difficult because it's going to be, the strategy of avoidance isn't going to work. It's going to be unavoidable that we talk more about race. But I think we need to increase the confidence, not increase the discomfort in the ways that people do it. And I see very, very few um, institutions in our society that really have a confidence in engaging with race, especially if we go to the citadels of economic power, cultural power, political power, media power. I see a level of discomfort in talking about race. And this, more discomfort is probably going to be part of this because your graduate intake is going to be a lot more ethnically diverse than your boardroom. It will be a quarter of your graduate intake and one in 16 people, if we're lucky, in the boardroom. And so you're going to have to have a conversation about how fast that's going to change or whether it's going to change. So there's going to be more discomfort, but I think we should be trying to decrease the sense of discomfort. What I thought we saw with the black squares, which were mentioned earlier, is we actually saw silence of solidarity. And that was, you know, it was very well intended. And I, I didn't like it. I think other people have said that they weren't very convinced. This was a very performative silence. I felt. And symbolism can be really important. Taking a knee can be important. Other forms of symbolism, a minute silence can be important. But this kind of performance of silence felt very paternalistic. It felt very othering and it felt very distant to me. It seemed to say we will be silent because your cause matters, but we don't know you yet. We're so sorry we haven't got to know you, but we don't. And because we will never really quite understand our way of showing solidarity will be to say we have nothing to say and we will make a great show and a great presence of having nothing to say. So people see us rending our garments, uh, being silent. And the institutions that did that, and you know, no doubt feeling that this was a powerful way to have solidarity and it may have done some good things, it may have brought some money and it may have funded some activities. They were perceiving of themselves really as very, very white and very distant and very much saying, you know, it's our, this is our product of solidarity without diversity, because we don't know you, because you're not here in the room, then we will be loudly silent. And we hope people will hear you speak instead. And we need to reduce that social distance. We need those organisations to do the work so that they have things to say. But that, that moment was also a product, actually, of asking people to stay silent and to be silent and to say to people, sometimes we are saying it's another way of using the discomfort, check your privilege, stay in your lane, 
do not speak. It is not your turn to speak. Or if you speak, speak in this way. This is the way that allies speak. And I think a lot of the way we use language around race is making people more uncomfortable, really. And there could be constructive discomfort, but I think there can be unhelpful discomfort. I think the way we use language about race, I've never particularly try, I tried not to use the words BAME as an acronym. I prefer words to acronyms and people don't know what we're talking about. But how did that become more popular in institutions, in human resources? Um, you know, nobody's identity as a BAME person. People just felt uncomfortable saying the word black. And so saying black, Asian, ethnic, minority, mixed race, you know, words, not acronyms, people just weren't quite sure what that sounded like coming out of their mouths. And so they wanted to find an acronym, a euphemism for what we were talking about, because talking about race was uncomfortable. So that's why I think we need to increase the confidence in talking about race. So voice matters. Um, we've heard tonight that all of the speakers think that voice can be shallow and empty and we can have a hashtag culture of white noise that gets in the way. But voice does matter and we want to encourage voice and we want to see that happen. So I think the Black Lives Matter uh, protests put race on the agenda in a way it hasn't been before. It meant many different things to people who are turning up and organising. It meant more different things to people who are supporting it online. It meant a lot of different things. We need to have more of a conversation about what that what that means and where that goes. Um, but I think most black people, most Asian people, most mixed race people in this country saw saw their concerns about racism reflected. We saw a cross ethnic movement more than we've seen before for anti racism. It was a cross ethnic movement of the young, actually, um, much more than it was a cross ethnic movement across generations and so there are intergenerational conversations to have now I think in our own extended families really about what this meant and what this didn't mean and what it could mean and what it should mean and why more people should get involved in anti-racism there are going to be different ways of pursuing anti-racism in different institutions in different spheres of power but we want to tell everybody that they have a part to play and so that is what makes me on balance unconvinced that urgency is good but the accusatory tone that silence is complicity that you need to prove that you are not guilty or that you're guilty until you speak i think it's going to make people hesitate more when we want them to turn up and join our causes so i think there's a shared agenda tonight to engage encourage promote voice and useful action less empty voice less hesitant silent. let's encourage it let's call for it let's invite people but i'm not sure that the accusatory term silence is complicity is going to broaden our cause as much as finding other ways to welcome people to be on the side of justice and tackling injustice and anti-racism that i think everybody here shares tonight thank you Uh, thank you very much, Sunda, uh, for your speech and for closing the debate uh, this evening. And thank you again to all six of our guests for um, uh, creating a, a really um, insightful um, and nuanced um, uh, event. Uh, I must say, uh, special give a, a special uh, remark of appreciation to um, the African and Caribbean Society in Cambridge for helping us put on the event uh, this evening. Um, I hope um, our audience enjoyed that uh, and thank you to those who submitted questions. Um, I'm just going to make uh, a brief plug uh, for the upcoming events this week because we have uh, a very busy next uh, seven days. Um, so tomorrow night at seven we have Mary Jean Chan, uh, the Hong Kong uh, poet, uh, Hong Kong Chinese poet laureate. Uh, then we have the business leader Mohammed El Erin on the 8th of March at 6.30, uh, followed uh, the next day by Craig Oliver and Amber Rudd in conversation uh, about the Remain campaign, that's at 6.30. Uh, then we have the sports, uh, sports coach Joe Wicks on the 10th of March at 7pm and we are back here uh, with our usual Thursday night debate um, at 8 um, next week and the debate motion is this house believes the hype around Shakespeare is much about nothing. So that's our termly literature debate. Um, I hope um, uh, everybody on the call um, had, a, had a pleasant evening uh, and I wish everyone a very good, good night. <laughs>